Hey gang, I am Joe Edelman, and welcome to The Last Frame Live. Tonight, we're going to talk about the idea that you may have too much gear. Said no photographer ever, right? But seriously, no joke, it may be hurting your photography. I promise. We'll also do a Q&A before we wrap up, so start typing. I'll do my best to answer all of your questions in the next 60 minutes. And hey, if you're watching live, you know the drill. Please leave me a note in the chat. Let me know who you are and where you're watching from. Already, I got Lynn here from New York, Willie in Germany. RG's here from Quebec, Joe in Michigan. We got uh, <laughs> Seraphin down in Orlando, Austin in Texas, uh, Darko up in Canada too. I got Ron all the way here from the future Thursday in Australia. Uh, Peter in Tulsa, Oklahoma, Ty in New Jersey. Ty's feeling a little guilty because I know he just picked up a brand new lens today. All of you, thank you so much for tuning in. And hey, if you're watching the replay, no worries. Drop me a comment below the video so that I know you were here. All of you, you're part of a growing global community of photographers in over 100 countries who tune in to watch The Last Frame every week. And for that, I am going to work really hard to help you with your photography in the next 60 minutes. And I got to tell you, it's great to be back after my break. So a couple people have sent me messages already. The puppy, her name is Sissy. She's doing great. Fully recovered. As of yesterday, we were able to take off the cone of shame. It's been a six-week process. Uh, it all started out just to give you the quick version of it. Woke up one morning and she was only opening her eye, her right eye, just a tiny little bit, which was kind of weird. Didn't know what was up. That continued throughout the course of the day. The next morning, took her to the vet. The vet rolled up the eyelid and what looked to me like a pimple on her eyelid. No big deal. Turns out it was a tumor. It was benign, no cancer, but the real damage, the tumor had really scraped up the cornea of her eye and done a whole lot of damage to the front of her eyeball. So she had to have surgery to take the tumor out. They stitched her all back up for that. And that went great. But then all this time, we've been having to give her drops and creams in her eyes several times a day. She's wearing the comb, but she's completely healed. Her high sight is back to normal and we're good to go. So uh, if you ever have to deal with that, believe me, having to give a dog drops and creams in their eye that doesn't want it, it's not fun, so I would not wish that on anyone. But for all of you who have asked, thank you so much for checking in and for all your good wishes, but she's doing great. And it's finally great to be back here. Also, don't forget, it would help a lot more people learn about The Last Frame. If you could do me a solid, hit that thumbs up down below the video. The more thumbs up, the more YouTube recommends the show to other photographers. And of course, while you're down there, feel free to hit that share button and let your photography friends know that we are streaming live on YouTube right now. Or you can just go ahead and share the link. I just put it in the chat, lastframe.live. It's also down in the show notes below. Twitter, Facebook, they're the fastest and the easiest way to get the word out while we're live, okay? So uh, I really have no big announcements or news tonight aside, of course, from Apple's new iPhone 14 taking one more step towards eliminating the need for professional cameras. And I'm kidding, but I'm not kidding. Um, I did not get to watch the keynote today. I've only seen some of the headlines. Uh, it looks like it's, you know, kind of incremental upgrades. Uh, look, you know, some nice future upgrades. I bought a 13 Pro last year. I will not be upgrading. Uh, it's not enough to make a, you know, big difference for me. But if you're one of those folks that's still holding on to like an iPhone 10 or iPhone 11, uh, now would you know certainly be a good time. There's a lot of really, really awesome upgrades in them. Um, I will remind you that on September 20th, so that's what, that's a Tuesday evening, I will be presenting an introduction to portrait photography. This is a free uh, Zoom presentation for anyone who wants to get started shooting portraits or even those who are shooting portraits but aren't getting the desired results. In fact, here, I'm going to go ahead and put the link in the uh, chat for you so you have it. Let me make sure that's in there. There we go. Good. Um, again, remember, it's free to attend. It will not be recorded. So you need to attend to learn. The link, it's in the description below the video, and I'll drop it in the chat for those of you that are here live. Okay. So 
this week's discussion, and it really is a, a, a serious discussion. I mean, obviously, you know, it's really tempting to kind of joke about this. The topic, you may have too much gear. And it may be, and actually probably is, hurting your photography, or at a minimum, it is impeding the progress that you are trying to make in terms of learning photography and becoming a better shooter. So let me give you a quick little bit of background here because, you know, there's a little bit of science behind this, a little bit of psychology behind this. Yeah, there's a little bit of opinion too, uh, but also some personal experience that I want to share. So for me, where this came from, the reason this even became a topic, you all know that I travel, I teach. I was just down in Houston, Texas this past Thursday. In fact, by the way, for those of you that I met down in Houston, thank you so much for coming out. Thanks to the folks at the Houston Camera Exchange for hosting us. Uh, really cool camera store, by the way. I got to visit that afternoon. I always have to be really careful when I do these trips and I visit the camera stores. It's kind of like leave the credit cards in the hotel room because that could be really dangerous, right? Uh, and also, I want to thank the folks at Tamron for sponsoring that trip to make it all come together and chuck with Tamron, who was there to show off a lot of the Tamron lenses and let people try them out. It was a fun event. But I travel, I teach, I have my talk knowledge learning community, I have my Facebook group, and I have a mentoring and accountability program. So that means I spend a lot of time talking to photographers who are trying to improve their skills. Hence my mission statement, helping photographers develop a better understanding of the hows and whys behind making consistently great photographs, right? So one of the things that I have been noticing recently, frustratingly so, and in reality, I've been noticing it for a long time, but I think recently I've, I've had a couple encounters that have just really kind of brought this thought together. And, and that is that people who get into photography in general, so I'm making a very generalized statement about all of us here, we, we tend to have some disposable income, right? And this is something that starts out maybe as a curiosity, maybe as a hobby, but then, you know, there's the bug that we catch and it's like, I just can't get enough of it. And that's when things start to go a little sideways because we want more gear to be able to do more things. We frequently make the mistake of thinking that more gear is going to make our photography better or allow us to do better things. You know, in all fairness, it's not that we always think that the gear is going to make us better, but we do think that the gear is going to allow us to get better. It's going to allow us to do things we weren't able to previously do, right? Uh, and, you know, there's a certain amount of validity to that, kind of, okay? But here's where it goes sideways. And this is what I see happening time and time and time again. And I think we're all guilty of it, and I'm guilty of it. And I'm going to explain to you what my situation was, and I'm going to tell you what I'm doing about it, right? But when we have the disposable income and we have the ability to pick up this gear, we pick it up. Why do we do that? Well, sometimes we joke and we say, hey, it's gas, gear acquisition syndrome. You know, what's that old phrase, boys with their toys, right? You know, I was never a motorhead. For me, a car is basic transportation, but a camera... <laughs> That's a whole nother thing, right? And, and even for me, the camera is kind of still basic transportation, but the lenses, the lighting, all the other gadgets, that's the cool stuff. I'll admit, right? So the problem with that is, for all of us, even me, the problem with that is, is we are human. Here comes some of the psychology and some of the science, but it's real stuff, guys. Don't take my word for it. Because look, I'm just some guy yapping at you on YouTube. Go, go look it up, right? The, the real science, it tells us that having too much, or worse yet, having too much too soon, it is overwhelming, it is distracting, and it gets in our way. So follow along. You know, we have this luxury in the photography world today compared to, let's say, 20, 30, 40 years ago, and that is that technology is amazing. You can go out and buy a camera, and I mean any camera, even a Pentax, any camera. 
and you could take pretty doggone good pictures. I mean, look at the pictures they showed during the Apple keynote today, right? Look at what you can do with an iPhone. It's amazing. So what does that do? It gives all of us a, a little bit of a kind of a, a false sense of ability. Because with minimal gear, minimal effort, heck, without even reading the camera manual, we can start taking pretty functional pictures because the cameras have incredible capabilities. But then we have this harsh realization. And that is that at the end of the day, that camera, it's still a computer. And even though AI technology is moving along at lightning speed and getting incredibly good, which by the way, I think is awesome, it's still not able to see what we see, think the way we think, and understand our creative desires and choices. Maybe down the road it will be, but not yet. So at the end of the day, in order to take and make consistently good or great photographs, there's only one way, and that is to learn the foundational skills. Without the foundational skills, all this gear that you might be able to afford, it will bite you in the butt. It will let you down. It is not going to get you consistently great results. So what happens is, and I'm going to use lighting as a perfect example. And if you follow me for a while, you've probably heard me give you this suggestion as to how to start out with lighting in terms of purchasing lighting and, and building a lighting kit. The big mistake that people make, even if they're buying cheap lighting off of Amazon, they go and they buy a lighting kit with two or three or four lights because they watched a bunch of YouTube videos and that's what the photographers on YouTube were doing, was using two, three, four lights and they thought, great, that's what I need to do if I wanna take pictures like that. And then because they have two, three or four lights, they're not going to take the time to really learn the foundational skills. They'll try and copy what's in the YouTube video. Sometimes with okay results, other times with absolutely horrible results. But even if they get lucky and come close to what the YouTube video does, the problem that they have is once you start to throw other variables in, you don't have a skill set. You only know how to copy what's in that YouTube video. So the problem that you have is, is you're at a loss for how to really make those work. And then you spend enough time on YouTube, you find all those photographers that love grids. You find all those photographers that love 600 watt second strobes. You find all those photographers that love huge soft boxes. And you find photographers like me that say, don't use grids, don't use 600 watt seconds. And it's like, oh my God, what do I do? So what you have to do is you have to build a foundation. So I'm gonna continue with the lighting example. The way that I recommend you do lighting as a learning curve, okay, is I recommend that when you're ready to get into lighting, and again, we're gonna use this one as the example. When you are ready to get into lighting, what you do is you do your research first. What kind of lighting do you want? Are you gonna work with speed lights? Are you going to work with studio strobes? What brands are you interested in? You know, it, can you justify spending a thousand dollars a lighthead and buying a pro photo? Are you better off with Godox? Do you want something in the middle like FJ Westcott, which by the way, does not necessarily make it better than Godox. It's just more expensive than Godox. But all of those things, you do your research. Better yet, if at all possible, go to a camera store. Go to a camera store and talk to the staff there. Pick up those lighting units. Check them out. Ask questions about them, get a feel for them. But then what you do is you sit down with a pen and a piece of paper or a computer and on paper, go hide your credit cards, build out your perfect lighting kit for whatever kind of work you want to do. You're not going to run out and buy it right away, but you are going to map out what is my lighting kit with this brand. And that includes, you know, how many heads, what kind of modifiers for the heads, what kind of stands, everything. 
Then you go out and you buy one light, one trigger, one stand. No modifiers, one light, one trigger, one stand. That's it. And you come back and you begin the process, the process of learning how to see light. If you can afford a mirrorless camera and a couple of lenses and you're buying lighting, you can afford to spend less than $70 and purchase a mannequin also. Buy a mannequin. If you want to get good at portrait lighting and photographing people, buy a mannequin. You have to give her a name or him a name. Buy them some clothes too. It's just weird if you don't. But get a mannequin and practice. And you practice with that one light and you learn how to make great portrait lighting with one light, no modifier. Basically direct off-camera flash. It is very possible to create really good, really flattering light with one direct off-camera flash. And then, once you've got that down that you can replicate it over and over and over again, you're going to add not a second flash, not a modifier, well, a modifier, but a dollar store modifier. Probably cost you a buck 25 now, but you're gonna get yourself a piece of white foam board, 24 inches by 36 inches or 24 by 30, whatever they are. And you are gonna use that as a reflector because it's cheap. Then when you've mastered that, now you can go ahead and you can add a soft box or an umbrella. And I would encourage you actually start with a shoot through umbrella or at a minimum, a soft box that is no bigger than 30 or 31 inches. Bigger is not necessarily better for portraits, not at all. You can create big light with small modifiers once you've learned how to use the inverse square law. And you can wind up creating really harsh, unflattering light with big modifiers if you don't understand the inverse square law. By building your system one piece at a time and by building your skill set one piece at a time, you will learn more, you'll learn faster, and you're teaching your brain to see the nuanced differences between what happens with just the one light and then when you add the second light. The most common problem people run into when they go out and they buy two, three, four, five lights all at once and then they try to use them is they can't identify what the different lights are doing to each other. And as a result, they're just piling light on, kind of like what they saw in some YouTube video, and they're not getting good results. So they flounder more, they flounder longer, they make more mistakes, they get subpar results, they spend a lot more time being frustrated, and all the while, they're not building a skill set. Right, when you learn how to drive a car, your parents didn't take you out on the freeway first time in the car, right? You probably went to a parking lot or you drove in your quiet little neighborhood, right? You, you work up to it. You start out with a skill set. And there's just, there's so many things that I could go through where essentially, you know, you, you start out small and you grow. When you learn to ride a bicycle, you either had a tricycle because you needed the extra wheel so you didn't fall off or you had training wheels. And then eventually your parents raised the training wheels a little higher and then a little higher and then a little higher and then eventually you take them off. So what's happening each step of the way? Each step of the way, you're refining your skill set a little bit more. With a bicycle, each step of the way, you're getting a little better at balancing. You're building a little bit more confidence. You are becoming more aware of the nuances of maintaining the balance so that once the wheels are off, you're able to manage it. That's how we learn as humans. Now, I should pause here and I should make an exception that applies to a few of you. Not all of you, but a few of you. I said before, you know, boys like their toys. We all like their toys. Our, our toys, excuse me. You know, it's, it's the gas, the gear acquisition syndrome. But let's be fair, just like with cars, there are people like me, a car is transportation. And then there are people that are hardcore motorheads that are diehard about their brand, that will only purchase a Ford or only purchase a Chevy, and they will argue till the cows come home about why Ford's better than Chevy or Chevy's better than Ford, and they would never ever consider buying a Hyundai, right? 
and they can tell you everything about what goes on in the engine and the horsepower and everything. What does this sound like? Sounds like every Sony owner I've ever known. I'm just kidding. No hate. I'm just kidding. I have a Sony. Relax. But it sounds like photographers. It sounds like photographers harping about megapixels and, and you know, everything else. There are people with cameras that are truly more into the camera than the art of photography. And let me be clear, if you're one of those folks, that's actually fine. Like, it's fine. If that's what gives you pleasure, that's fine. But be honest with yourself that all of that attention to those details and that minutia and that hardware is not actually improving your photography, right? It's giving you pleasure because you are into the tech and into the hardware and into the gear. Good for you. So I'm not really addressing right now that category of photographer, right? So that being said, for the rest of you that want to make really great images, and, and by the way, I, I don't, I'm not in any way minimizing the people that are like really into gear. Okay, it's just, it's acknowledging for, for some people that is where they draw their pleasure in photography, right? Others, indeed, it's a finished image that, that they really want to be able to do something creative and different and unusual, okay? So um, for those folks, which is, you know, kind of the rest of us, we have to realize that by having all this extra gear, we simply make it really hard for ourselves to build foundational skills. Now, I had an advantage that many of you don't have. Well, it's an advantage that very few of you have now, today, but I had this advantage 40 some years ago. And that advantage was that I started at age 11. I got my first speed light and then an umbrella when I was 13 years old. It was a Vivitar 283, and it was a Photoflex white um, umbrella. Not translucent, just a white umbrella. And I couldn't afford to buy more lights and more modifiers. So I learned lighting, one light, one modifier at a time, because I couldn't afford any more. It turns out that was a blessing in disguise. Because then anytime I would add a new piece, everything that that new piece was doing in relationship to my other gear was visually very obvious. And it was much easier to control it and manipulate it. Because remember, this was back in a time where we didn't have TTL, we didn't have wireless controls. You know, we're, I'm talking dinosaur ages here, gang. So, you know, everything was manual. And you do all this work, and then you wait seven days to find out you suck. Truly. So... Doing it a step at a time made it so much better and so much easier. And also because we didn't have this thing called the internet where we could get a quick, here's how you do it in 30 seconds or less. We read camera manuals. We read flash manuals. We read books, horrible books, but they had all the information. And we learned the foundational pieces. And, and this is the piece that I'm finding is happening. So many, and a couple of the people that I talked to recently are watching tonight. I won't name anybody, but you know who you are. Feel guilty because you were the inspiration for this conversation. You know, we're getting way too much gear too soon. And the solutions that we're looking for is how do I use these five pieces of gear? Not how do I learn to light with one? and then with two, and then with three, so that I actually learn lighting. Now, I know right now, a lot of you are hearing that and saying, wow, yeah, that's what I did. That's what I'm doing. You're not going to get there. Like, literally, you're not going to get there. And, and if you do, you are extending the amount of time it will take you to get there. There being creating consistently great images, meaning properly exposed, good composition, good lighting, all those things on a consistent basis. At a minimum, you are 
dramatically extending the amount of time it will take you. Breaking it down, being deliberate, being thorough, you will get there so much faster. I promise you. Now, the other piece of where this came from, because I said part of it, something that I have been doing and realized that I needed to do. So for the last uh, six months, off and on, and, and I still have some to go, by the way, I'm not done, but you know, I made the switch from Olympus to Sony. I'm 100% I'm Sony now. I'm shooting with the A7R4A. I'm shooting with the A7IVs, you know, out of location. Uh, all Tamron lenses because I refuse to buy Sony glass for a whole litany of reasons. Um, very happy with them. You know, I kind of have a love-hate relationship with Sony cameras, but very happy with my choice. That's where I'm at. But here's what I realized while I was making the transition. Over the last, especially, I would say, six or seven years, eh, you know, maybe even a little bit more since I started doing YouTube, and probably throughout pieces of my career, I have accumulated a ridiculous amount of gear. Ridiculous amount of gear. Uh, once, you know, I started doing the YouTube thing, you get to a point too where it's cool for five minutes. You know, people, companies just send you stuff to try it out. It's like, hey, this is really neat. Until you realize that you get these toys, you don't really use them. You would never actually spend your own money on a lot of them. And then they sit around. So uh, I'm ashamed to admit this, but I'll give you a really good example. Um, a few weeks ago, I went through my studio and I use pretty much exclusively uh, Photix uh, modifiers at this point, the Photix Rajas. And my my favorite, all-time favorite is the 33-inch Photix Raji. Like awesome, Ronnie, excuse me, awesome modifier. That's like hands down my favorite modifier. It's a collapsible soft box slash beauty dish. Um, those are the modifiers that I use straight across the board. And then, of course, the Westcott uh, translucent umbrella, which, by the way, um, Real American Negro, you asked the question, where do you get a $15 umbrella from? Um, you can buy cheap Chinese umbrellas on Amazon for $15 or less. Uh, if you're looking for an umbrella to learn lighting with, um, I would strongly encourage you, and you get it at B&H, you can get it at Adorama, you can get it at Amazon, or better yet, depending on where you live, you can actually get it at a camera store. Gang, if you live near a camera store, support your local camera stores. That's a whole other conversation, but it's extremely important. Support your local camera stores because believe it or not, they're supporting you. And if you don't understand how they're supporting you, then you're being very foolish by not taking advantage of what they're doing for you. So again, that'll be a separate conversation. But better yet, you can buy this umbrella from them and it is the cheapest item that Westcott makes. It is their 31-inch collapsible umbrella. It's $21 is the last price I saw it very, very recently, okay? Um, they fold up super, super small, super easy to use, great light. And if you put in the time, meaning learn the basics, experiment and practice with that umbrella, learn to understand the inverse square law and how it works, on my YouTube channel here, I have a video showing you how I used that umbrella to create the exact same lighting that you get from a several hundred dollar beauty dish. So again, simple modifier combined with the inverse square law, you can do amazing things as a photographer. You can go ahead and buy really expensive modifiers and if you don't understand the inverse square law, you're gonna do crap lighting, okay? So that being said, uh, I realized that I had well over 30 soft boxes, which I'm embarrassed to say. Um, I will say I probably only purchased about half of them, but even at 15, that's way too many. Some of them I bought literally 20 years ago. So, I mean, I've had them for quite a while because I take care of my gear, right? Uh, by the way, the biggest thing with modifiers, taking care of modifiers, don't leave them in high humidity spots. So like if you have a studio in your basement, like I do, make sure that you're either using a dehumidifier and controlling the humidity or don't store your uh, soft boxes and umbrellas in the basement with the humidity. That will cause the material to discolor faster than anything else. And then it throws off your white balance. 
that's not good, right? So remember, you know, they have material, material that is white and diffused, and you do not want that material to change color. So humidity is not your friend when it comes to that, okay? Um, so I decided, you know what? It's time to pair back, pair way back. So I am now down to four soft boxes, two umbrellas, and that's it. Those are the only modifiers that I have. Um, I have been selling off gear left and right. And in a couple of weeks, I'm actually going to talk to you about how I sold all my used gear um, and what I would encourage you to do. Because obviously, there's a lot of ways you can sell used gear. Um, and there's always that debate. Well, if I sell it through like a camera store, you know, I'm not going to get as much money if I sell it directly to somebody, maybe through Facebook or eBay. And, and you're correct, you won't. But there's some other good reasons. So I'm going to, you know, talk all about that. And then the other thing I'm going to do, just to give you a little uh, kind of preview, um, I am going to actually start talking a little bit more about gear. Don't panic. I, I'm, I'm not going to be coming on here, you know, every time Sony comes out with a camera or somebody comes out. No, 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 no. I am going to start sharing with you uh, essentially my gear that I use and really teaching you about why I use it. So uh, just to give you kind of an example of, of how I'm going to break this down, on my website, I have a page, my current photography gear. In fact, here, I'll go ahead and share the link. And by the way, if you have questions tonight, I'm just about ready to wrap up. So start typing your questions, okay? There's a couple in here, but come on, we got time, All right? So there's the page that I'm showing you. So like next week, as an example, I want to talk about a piece of gear. And, and I have, you know, all of my current uh, gear on here, cameras, lenses, um, the stuff I use for live streaming bags. And, and I'm updating this. I still have a lot of stuff that I need to add but I am literally gonna get this thing completely updated. Um, one of the pieces of gear that I'm gonna to talk to you guys about next week that I actually just got my hands on recently and I'm absolutely in love with it. And it's a piece of gear that not enough photographers use. And it's not for everybody, so this doesn't mean you all need to run out. You need to wait till next week and I am going to tell you about this monopod. It's by Siri, it's carbon fiber, super lightweight, super small. In fact, just to give you a sense, this is my think tank bag that I carry. You can see it fits in the pocket, doesn't stick up too high. So super, super small. Um, I will give you a breakdown of why I use the monopods, when I use them, the different ways that I use them, etc. And I'm going to go through pretty much every piece of gear that I have over the next year, one at a time, and I want to break down the actual decision-making process. What does this piece of gear do for me? Why do I have it? Is it a piece of gear that I'm using every time I shoot? Is it a piece of gear that I use occasionally? So most importantly, how did I justify spending the money for that piece of gear and keeping that piece of gear after the purge? Because I'm not going to lie to you, right now, my studio, I'm loving it. I've got tons of extra space in my studio because I'm just getting rid of so much stuff that I honestly don't use. Again, some of it was given to me. Some of it is stuff that I purchased. I've used it. I'm done with it. It's time to move on, okay? Um, so this is going to be a weekly feature. It's going to be all across the board from cameras to lenses. Next week, it's going to be that Siri monopod. In two weeks, I will show, and I've got a bunch, a today of all times, I got a whole bunch of people ask me this question today. Messages about what was it about Tamron? Why did you pick Tamron? Why won't you use Sony glass? And you might be surprised. There's some kind of really obvious reasons. And there's a couple of reasons that a lot of people I'm finding are not aware of. Like the fact that I have six Tamron. In fact, here, I'll go back. I have um, five Tamron, six Tamron lenses, excuse me. So there, this is the six of them right here. I have one Samyang fisheye, the 12 millimeter fisheye. But I have these six lenses. Five of these lenses, the 24, um, whoops, that's mislabeled. The 24, the 35, the 17 to 28, the 28 to 75, and the 70 to 88, all five of those use the same size filter thread. How about that? Same size filter across the board. No camera manufacturer does that. None, okay? Um, optical quality on these lenses is awesome. Price, even better yet. 
Sony lenses, ridiculously big, ridiculously heavy, and so on and so forth. But I'll break that all down for you. Two weeks, I'm going to explain why did I pick Tamron and, and you know what was the motivation behind my choice and also the lenses that I got. Because you'll also notice if you look at a brand like Tamron, the focal length ranges of their lenses are a little bit different than the manufacturers. So for instance, you know, a 28 to 75, whereas you know, most of the manufacturers like Sony, they have a 24 to 70 or a 70 to 180 instead of a 70 to 200. There's actually a real simple reason why companies like Tamron and even Sigma do that. I'll explain it to you. I'll break it down um, and it'll make complete sense once I you know, once, once I lay it out for you. So, so anyway, that's going to be a new feature that we're going to build in each week, five, 10 minutes max, um, you know, a little piece about gear and it, but from the sense of this is something that I use, this is why I find it valuable. This is how I find it valuable. And, you know, this is how you might consider it at no point. Are you going to hear me say you need to have one of these? Because the fact of the matter is the monopod is the first perfect example of that. Depending on what you shoot, you need a monopod. Like if you're a sports shooter, you should have a monopod. Uh, but at the same time, portrait photographers can use monopods. Landscape photographers can use monopods. Architectural photographers can use monopods. So there's no black and white, you know, it's an item is only for this or it's only for that. But there are reasons why you would and wouldn't consider them. So that's how we're going to break it down. That's what we're going to get into. But to summarize the conversation tonight, you know, you might have too much gear. It might be hurting your your progress. The hardest part about this conversation is your takeaway. Because to find any value in this conversation, you have to do a little bit of soul searching and you have to be really honest with yourself. And one of the observations that I'm making is that a lot of photographers who are putting in a tremendous amount of money and effort to improve their photography are really kind of shooting themselves in the foot and making it 10 times harder because they're buying every cool piece of gear that they can find because they can afford to buy it. And good for you that you can afford to buy it. But my advice would be start yourself a little spreadsheet, you know, either like on a notepad or make yourself like a little, you know, Google Sheets or Excel, whatever. And it's kind of like your wish list of things, literally. And, you know, the good part about putting in a spreadsheet is you can change the order of the rows really easily. So you can reprioritize them as you go. But by doing that and, and making that a rule, like I'm not buying anything unless it's on the spreadsheet and it's got to be on the spreadsheet for X period of time before I will buy it. That's going to tend to slow you down a little bit, force you to do a little bit more research and really consider it. And always, here's one of the things that I ask myself when it comes to gear, okay? It's in terms of, do I need that piece of gear? I always need it because I want it, right? Let's be real. We, we always find a way to justify the need, but that doesn't mean we need it, right? Even though we tell ourselves it does. So what you gotta do is you gotta ask yourself, how often am I likely to use this? That's literally what it comes down to. How often am I likely to use it? So it's easy to say, look, I need it because it's going to do a better job for this shoot that I'm going to do in two weeks. But after two weeks, in the course of the next year, how many times are you honestly likely to use that lens? And don't kid yourself with the, well, I'll use it more now that I have it, because you won't, okay? It's based on need. And the need doesn't have to be a client the need can simply be your shooting style and what you routinely shoot. Because if the answer is you're only going to use it once or twice a year, maybe you should consider renting. If it's for a client, hell yes, rent it. Don't buy it. If it's for yourself, join a camera club, borrow it. Look for another way to do it and ask yourself, well, okay, this lens is a little wider than the lens I have, but do I really need one that is quite that wide, right? By doing the spreadsheet plan and evaluating the big picture, what you're also seeing in that spreadsheet is you're seeing what your dreams cost. 
You're seeing what your gas is going to cost you. Helps keep you anchored a little bit better in reality. And then what you do is every spreadsheet document, whether it's Google Sheets or whether it's you know Excel or Apple Numbers, you can have multiple sheets within the spreadsheet. So you make a second sheet within your spreadsheet and that's the gear that you own. That's the gear that you've purchased. So once you buy something that's in your first list, you move it to the purchased list. And every so often you get to look at that purchase list and you see just how much gear you actually own. It keeps you aware of, hey, am I getting myself in a situation here where it's great that I can afford this stuff, but what am I really doing with all this? Because if I'm being honest with myself, I really have a hard time creating great images with it. At the end of the day, I can tell you this, photography is so much more satisfying when you're able to produce great work. And I've seen you know, a couple of people in here tonight, well, yeah, you know, I wanna get this lens, I wanna get that lens. Um, I'm sorry, but that's not the way to go about it. Um, Real American Negro, your question, what do the basic five things all beginners need? I'm not gonna answer that question. One, because it's a lazy question because there is no such thing as all beginners. Are you a beginner landscape photographer, beginner portrait photographer? What kind of beginner are you? Two, okay, I don't know what you have. Three, everything I've just said, I would be negating it if I gave you a list of things to go buy. Learn photography with what you have. And then you let your process force your hand at what you have to get. It's the best way to do it. Okay, gang. So, that being said, I still got just about 15 minutes here, and I'm gonna scroll back up through the, the chat here just to see where I'm at with questions. Um, I thought I saw a couple in here early. Uh, and by all means, go ahead and, uh, and type. Uh, Brian Miller, I, I definitely have too much gear and it gives me anxiety uh, when trying to decide what to take with me. Yeah, and you know, Brian, I've, I've been there so I can, I can completely re relate, okay? Um, you know, if you are a person that, that struggles, you know, with the decision-making process because you do have too many options, uh, that honestly can be another great reason to minimize the amount of gear that you have because, um, you know, you kind of feel like you, you need to pack everything because what if I need it? Uh, back in my early days as a newspaper photographer, um, that was a big flaw of mine, especially as I got into my 20s and started to accumulate more gear. Uh, you know, I would go out to shoot assignments and I would frequently have way too much gear with me. Uh, fortunately, back in the late 1970s and the early 1980s, you know, being in a small town paper, I could use my car as a camera bag and it wasn't likely to get stolen, right? That's not as easy in today's world, pretty much wherever you live. But, um, you know, now that I am older and don't want to have to break my back lugging gear around, I actually find it a lot easier to make decisions in terms of, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm going to leave this lens at home because I really don't need this. Uh, or, yeah, you know, I wish I had the fisheye with me today, but in all likelihood, I'm going to use it for one shot if I have it. So, you know, it's staying at home because I really need these other pieces of gear to go with me. Um, and I purposely, while I, I do have multiple sizes of camera bags, um, I have gotten in the habit over the last, you know, probably four or five bags that I've purchased of buying smaller bags so that I don't have the ability to overload them. And that, that helps a little bit in terms of, you know, kind of managing that process. Um, so let's see here. Um, Peace Valley Auto. I have one speed light, a 36 inch softbox, and a $15 umbrella. And whoops, that's, that's the wrong message here. Where is it? There it is. Uh, um, and a stand, and that's all I need for now. And honestly, you can do you can do amazing lighting with a speed light and a 36 inch softbox and a $15 umbrella. Um, it, it's not about how much gear you have, it's really about how to use it because you could actually take that $15 umbrella, you can make it look like a, um, make it look like a beauty dish, you can make it look like um, a, a big softbox, you can make it look like a very small softbox. It's all about understanding the inverse square law and light placement, et cetera, okay? 
Um, let's see, scrolling on down here. Uh, TC, everything you say is absolutely correct. Spot on. Thank you for agreeing. Um, it's honestly, it's just, it's practical. It's, it's practical thought process. Okay. Um, Philip McCallum, my local camera shop, uh, always has time for my silly questions, uh, and offers advice on what I think I want. There are a bunch of great people and they also price match a bonus is they don't sell great market gear. Yeah. So, you know, um, I, I alluded to this earlier. Let me just go into a little bit more detail here. It is really, really tough for smaller mom and pop type camera stores in today's world. So let me be clear now that I said that I'm not encouraging you to support them because I feel sorry for them. Not at all. I'm a big believer in go where I get the best price, the best service, period, right? Um, Amazon, B&H, Adorama, they all serve an important place in our industry. I mean, Amazon, it's price and speed, right? Um, B&H and H and Adorama, it's price and speed. Plus, both of those companies provide a tremendous amount of educational resources online. Tremendous amount. And by the way, if you're not taking advantage of those resources, wow. Okay. But your local camera stores, the ones that are in business today, because most of them, literally most of them have failed. But the ones that are around, they're around because they were smart. Not because they're expensive, because indeed most of them will price match. It, you know, they will sell you things at the same price as B and H. Buying camera gear today um, is a lot like, especially when we're talking cameras and lenses. It's a lot like buying a television set. It's the same price everywhere, right? And the simple reason for that is most of the camera and lens manufacturers now they set the pricing structures across the board, so the dealers have very little flexibility. Now, I will give you a little tip. I maybe I'm I get myself in trouble for this, but for those of you that have a local camera store that you can visit, anytime you see them advertising on social media or on their website that, hey, it's going to be Sony Demo Day on Saturday or Tamron Demo Day on Sunday or, or whatever, you know, or the rep from this company is going to be here or that company, if you're looking at buying a product from that brand, that's a good time to go to the store for two reasons. One, they'll always have stuff in stock because the sales rep's coming to do demos. So that sales rep, if they're doing a job, made sure that that store's stocked up with gear before they get there. That's number one. Number two, most, not all, most equipment manufacturers, so we're talking cameras and lenses, their sales reps have the ability to walk into the store and only while they're in the store offer an additional 10 to 15% discount over the regular prices. So, you know, you have to be there when the sales rep's there. Sales reps almost always make an event when they go. So the stores will advertise it on their website, on social media. But if you walk in and they're not allowed to put like on social media, hey, come during this demo and you'll get an extra 50% off. They're not allowed to advertise it. That's the thing. Because especially if it's a town where there's more than one camera store, right? If they let one camera store do 15% off and advertise it, they have to let the other one where they're not going also do 15% off. So it's not a game. It's just the way it works, right? But understand that if you're looking at a camera lens, you're looking at a Sony camera, a Canon camera, a Nikon camera, whatever, it is to your benefit to go to the store when the sales reps are there. But the, the reason why these stores are surviving is they're building community and they're supporting the community and they support education. That's why like Houston Camera Exchange had me to you know, their store last week and we did a demo. You guys know, you know I've done uh, store demos for um, you know, virtually companies like Bedford Camera in Oklahoma and Arkansas. I've done uh, Precision Photo in Austin, Texas. Um, Fort Worth photo in Fort Worth, Texas, uh, you know, everybody from, you know, Hunts in New England to Arlington Camera in Washington, D.C., like you name it, okay, across the board. I've done tons of the Cardinal Camera right down the road from me uh, in, in Lansdale, um, Roberts out in the Midwest, um, all these stores. And I know I'm forgetting some. Uh, Pixel Photo in, in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, 
these are great stores. They're great stores because they support their customers. When you walk in, most of the salespeople that are behind the counter are passionate, avid photographers, right? So they're not people that are just trying to sell you. They're people that are really into photography. And these stores don't survive by just selling you product, selling you product, selling you product. Because if they sell you crap that you don't need or don't like, you're not going to come back. These stores invest in you and your photographers. So they're great resources, right? They just simply are. So that's why you support your local camera stores. All right? Okay, so uh, let's see what else I got here. Uh, scrolling on down. Uh, TC, I definitely want to hear about gear. Okay, well, you will, I promise. Um, let's see, uh, Permanence, why did you choose the uh, B&W Polarizer, Polarizer over Hoyas range? Um, since I am not a landscape photographer, right? I went with the B&W because from a Polarizer standpoint, um, I was looking at prices. I wanted one with particularly good glass and theirs was a little bit on the cheaper side, still kind of mid range. It wasn't like dirt cheap, you know, $23. Um, but it was like mid range price. And that's why polarizer is not a filter that I use a lot. Um, in fact, the entire time I was an Olympus shooter, I did not own a polarizer. I didn't own any ND filters for the simple reason, just like with, Canon, Nikon, et cetera, uh, Sony lenses, I would have had to own multiples of them. So, and, and the idea that I would have to buy them and only be able to use only one or two lenses was really annoying. So I just never purchased them. Um, when I decided to go with Tamron and bought my Tamron kit, um, getting the neutral density filters, the variable ND, and getting the polarizer was kind of my treat to myself for all the money that I was saving and for the fact that uh, I could use those filters on five, because you're not going to use a filter like that on 150 to 600 millimeter zoom lens anyway, right? So I could use those filters on all five of the lenses. That's why I, I went with with that one. Uh, Sean, smaller bags under 30 liters. Uh, yes, for traveling light, super, super important for sure. Okay. Uh, Peace Valley Auto, your audio, your videos on lighting have definitely helped me move forward. I thought I needed more lights to take proper portraits. That's wrong. Thank you. Very glad to hear that. Okay. Um, yeah, <laughs> Joe's photography. We should have a contest to win Joe's used gear. Um, yeah, actually, most of it's gone. Um, I would love to be able to give it away, but um, I, uh, I unfortunately I had to trade it in. So, um, Peace Valley Auto, you do demos at Cardinal and Lansdale. I'm very local at that store. Peace Valley Audio, um, I'm in Allentown. I have done demos there uh, for Olympus. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I, 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 I'm like, you know, have camera, we'll teach. Wherever somebody wants me, that's where I go. But I actually purchased Peace Valley Auto since you know, you know Cardinal, you know Lansdale. I grew up in Lansdale. My first newspaper job was with the North Penn Reporter, now just called The Reporter. Uh, I went to North Penn High School, but um, I purchased my first camera ever. So I was 11 years old, 1971. I purchased my very first camera from Cardinal Camera, not in its current location. And the owner was Kirk, who's the current owner. It was his father, George, uh, who actually sold me the camera. I still have the receipt, handwritten, um, you know, receipt for that camera. So yeah, that was that was where I got my start. Okay, uh, Sam Coleman just went through a gear purge, very liberating. It is actually, it really is, and it forced me to really get to know and better use the equipment that I kept. Uh, you were just spot on. Well, thank you. I appreciate uh, I appreciate that. But it is very true. Um, you know, the thing that was kind of the um, the wake up for me, shall we say, is I had kind of gotten lazy with all of the gear that I had. And by really kind of trimming the gear back, I find myself in a position where I'm actually having a little bit more fun because you hear you guys hear me talk all the time about being a little bit type A and working too fast. You know, now... I'm 
able to slow myself down even a little bit more because I'm spending a little bit more time and effort on the various small processes of problem solving and getting things done with less gear and getting it done simpler. Uh, and I'm actually really enjoying it. And it's not like a nerdy thing. It's really, it's a quality thing. Uh, it just makes a really, really big difference. So, um, Peter Ferris, I see the note here, potential topic for future um, community discussion for Todd knowledge. What is the topic? I'm sorry, I missed the point where you posted that in there. Uh, Peace Valley. Oh, you're a school driver for North, or school bus driver. Gosh, you're a hero uh, for North Penn and Central Bucks. Yeah, I uh, I, I was a, a North Penn kid. My first job was a reporter. Uh, I actually freelanced for the Intelligencer, which is based out of Doylestown for a little while. And uh, my first full time newspaper job, uh, I was hired right out of high school as a chief photographer of the Quakertown Free Press, which is now defunct. But at the time, it was a daily newspaper. Had about 20, 22,000 circulation daily. Uh, yeah, that was my that was my first first job. So, all right, gang. Um, if you don't have any other questions, I want to remind you guys about one last thing before we're done here. Okay, uh, Peter Ferris. I did the hog auction photos while I was at the Quakertown Free Press, and I did those at the Quakertown. Q Mart, or as it's what the locals call it, Q Mart, but it's called the Quakertown Farmers Market. So yeah, that's where I did those. Um, one last reminder: I have told you guys uh, a bunch of times about my learning community that I started. Uh, the community is called Tog Knowledge. Okay, I want to share a little bit of this with you and and just show you here, kind of really quick. I'm gonna take myself full screen so I can show you this full screen. Uh, it's not social media, gang. Uh, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm kind of surprised that more of you have not considered joining. But please, hear me out before you go start typing and sign up. Hear me out, right? Um, this is not social media. So if you join, you have to participate. And that doesn't mean like you got to be there every day and do all that kind of stuff. No. Um, you don't even have to be there once a week. I, I would suggest you try and make it once a week, but that's not necessary. But every six months, I purge people who have not posted anything or commented or liked anything or participated in the community. I only want people there that are really interested in learning. But we have a ton of stuff in here. So right now we're up to, actually, let me see how many countries it is. We have photographers in here from 35 different countries is what we're up to. Um, the sections of it, we have a community center, which is where people, you know, basically post kind of what they've been doing on you know Mondays or what they're getting ready to do on the weekend. If people have questions, if they're trying to solve problems, actually here's some pictures uh, from my uh, event that I did down in Houston, some behind the scenes shots from last week, some little video clips there. If you haven't seen them, you can check those out. So it's just, you know, it's a place to chat, see what's going on. Uh, announcements, this is mostly me sharing information and things that I've been doing up to things that are coming up in the community. Every week we have a shot of the week winner they get an award for the coolest picture that was posted in the group for the week. Uh, this image from uh, Nicola Merlino came from Italy. Really, really awesome image. Um, featured members is a new thing I started where we actually feature various members in the group, uh, share off various um, uh, images that they've done, share a little bit about their background. These are photographers of varying skill sets, varying degrees of experience, et cetera. Um, we do a fun thing. It's called the quote of the day. So every single day, Monday through Friday, we post a new quote, okay? But then your task as a member, and, and obviously not everybody does it. You don't have to do it, but it's to come in and illustrate it. So let me find one here. So like, you know, um, this one, quote of the day for August 31st. I often use a white background because it doesn't interfere with anything. I aim for a timeless look one that doesn't date is by David Bailey. And then you select a picture of yours and you illustrate it. Photo shares. This channel, people love this. It's a love only channel. No negative feedback, no constructive feedback allowed. This is a spot for you to post pictures, tell a little story about them. You can post up to three images per post and just share. Okay. Uh, if you have images that need help. We have the image help section where you post the image, you answer some questions about it. And then uh, I have a couple that I need to do because last week with my traveling, but what happens then is I take the information from that post and I do a video review of the post. Primatis, you asked how many members are there currently? We're just about at 300. 
Um, here's another cool part of it. Photo Edu, every single day you get an article or a video from me. Image breakdowns, these are my images that I post. Uh, the goal is to do these once every like week and a half, two weeks. I post the lighting backgrounds, how I did the shot, behind the scenes video clips, all that kind of stuff. Um, there are interviews that I have done with various photographers. You can watch the videos, you can listen to the audio. The photo blogs, we're talking Petapixel, DIY photography, S-stoppers, photo focus, DP review, SLR lounge, PD Line, Pop Photo, Imaging Resources, and Digital Photo Pro, all those photo blogs. Every article that they post shows up here in my community within seconds of them posting it. It's completely legal. I'm not stealing it. They give me the content. So you, instead of you having to go to all these various websites for all these articles, they're all right here, and you can read the articles in Tog Knowledge. I also have them separated. If you're like me, you don't care about the gear, you can go through the photo news from the photo blogs and not read any gear articles at all. If you want the gear articles, you click on the gear basement and here are all the gear articles separated out. Super sweet, okay? So, um, and we, you know, we have a messaging system. We get together once a week. We do video meetups, all that kind of stuff. Come back to that. My bad, sorry. Um, it's a great community. If you join, you have to post a profile picture that shows your face. We want to see you. You will get to know photographers in this community. If you don't want to get to know people, don't join. Uh, when you join, you have to share a link to either an Instagram profile and or a website that has your photos on it. No marketing, no other crap, but you have to have one or the other. Simply because if you comment on something that somebody does, it's only fair that if they don't know you, they can look at some of your photos to get a sense of what your skill level is to understand how to interpret your comments. It's very reasonable. We don't review your photos on your profiles or anything like that, okay? But you have to share a link. And then you'll be asked to ask, answer four questions. Um, where are you from? A couple of other things. Put some effort into it. Don't just rush through it and blow them off. I don't take kindly to that. Again, this is a community. We get to know each other. Okay, so, all right, now, of course, I'm over time when I was ahead of time a few minutes ago. Uh, Peace Valley Audio, uh, I saw your question about how would you approach a newspaper to try and get a job as a photographer. Um, it's the which comes first, the chicken or the egg thing. And if you show up for talk chat or for talk chat for the last frame next week and ask me that question again, I'll give you more detail. But basically, in today's world, number one, there are very few newspaper jobs. So almost all newspaper work is freelance. You're not going to get a job, especially not in southeastern Pennsylvania working for a newspaper full time. Uh, but it's also a matter of which came first, the chicken or the egg. You need a portfolio to get work. How do you get a portfolio without work? Talk to me next week and I'll explain how you can become a freelancer or what they call in the newspaper business, a stringer, okay? Um, that being said, gang, great to see all of you again. Uh, it, it's great to be back at this. Believe me, the last couple of weeks have been rough, but I'm over time. Thank you. All of you for watching. I hope that you found some value in what I shared with you tonight. And please, look, you're not getting any younger. You've got less time left than you did yesterday. So go pick up that camera and shoot something. Because your best shot, it's your next shot. Adios, gang. Take care.